The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, good morning. This is Arthur joining from Delta E here in Scotland in Edinburgh. Welcome to Delta E's webinar on the connected markets, more specifically about connected electric thermal loads. We will discuss the study we recently completed on this topic. This webinar is recorded, so we will be able to put it on YouTube afterwards. You can share it with your colleagues. If you want the slides at the end of the webinar, we can also send that to you. Uh, there will be plenty of time for, for questions, uh, or if you want as well, we can follow up with you and discuss that topic as well. The webinar will last around 45 minutes. We hope to get through the slides in about 30 minutes, leaving the, uh, the last 15 minutes for, for questions. Right, and let's get started. But before we, we talk about the contents, uh, let me introduce you to the team here around the table. Uh, so that's myself, Arthur Juanik on the top left of the slide. Uh, I lead our work here on the digital energy in Delta E. I'm together with, with Matty, who is the, the research lead on the Connect the Home. Welcome, Matty. Morning, everyone. We also have Evita, who is uh, one of the analysts who worked on, on this study. Hi, Evita. Hi, everyone. And finally, our special guest coming from a, our flexibility service, looking at how the flexibility market will take off in Europe soon. Pip, welcome, Pip. Good morning, everyone. And you will see other members of the team at the bottom of the slide, Maria and Neil, who contributed to, to the study. Um, you probably would know us already, but if you want to connect with us on LinkedIn or send us emails, you will see all the details here today. Some practicalities for this webinar. So we will leave 15 minutes at the end, as I said, for questions. The software uh, go to webinar will allow you to ask questions. So there will be a small question box. We are monitoring this as we go. If we can answer the questions by writing, we will do that uh, quickly. If we can answer the questions at the end, we will um, let everyone know what the question is and try to answer it. And if we can't, we will follow up with you after the webinar uh, to have a discussion on that particular question. So feel free to be interactive and we will monitor everything. Brief word about Delta E. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will already know about us, but just to recap a little bit on what we do, our mission is really to help companies be successful in the transition of the energy system. And basically, the transition means we're coming from a world of centralized generation, very carbon intensive, uh, commodity sales meter points, etc. But everything today is moving toward more distributed, low carbon, uh, service based, and for the connected home specifically, a little bit more customer centric as well. So our goal is really to help you transition from uh, left to right. This is a list of some of our clients. We work primarily for two types of clients, uh, one being the energy companies from the suppliers, the network companies uh, and more to uh, product manufacturers, primarily around uh, HVAC companies, but also control companies and other types of technologies that will uh, disrupt the, uh, the new energy markets. We do also some work for startups, association, policy shapers, investors, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of what we offer to clients, we have two main business models, one being uh, the traditional consulting at the bottom and the one at the top being uh, multi-client studies and research subscription. We have a wide range of, of topics, including heat, digital, distributed generation, and electric vehicles. We also look at new energy business models and that really allows us to have a complete overview of what's happening in the new energy space. And we think that's one of the big strengths that we have specifically to cover particular topics which overlap with each other, like uh, smart controls for electric heating and cooling and the flexibility markets, because we have experts who understand both space very well and we're able to make uh, to link these two spaces very well and understand what's going on. And you will see at the bottom some example of consulting works uh, we have done and are still doing. Um, some strategic work for um, board levels, some uh, markets analysis, uh, portfolio analysis, etc. 
But enough about us. This is the agenda we will cover today. Uh, so we will first have a, a sort of overview at the context of uh, this study, why we did this and how this fits within the transition from uh, old energy to new energy. Uh, Pip will uh, tell us a bit more about how flexibility works and what's really important to understand specifically related to uh, heating and cooling. We will talk about the, the main approaches for connecting electric thermal loads. So how companies are going about it, what kind of technologies they are using, some example companies doing this. And finally, we will look at um, what, what we take away from that study, uh, some of the barriers and opportunities, future trends, etc. And that will include some of the time for the, the questions at the end as well. So the, by looking at the new energy market, what we really started to see and that's being validated by, by everyone in the industry, is two main trends actually happening in the electricity space. One being there will be a lot more electricity used uh, by the market going forward. One of the reasons to this <clears throat> is because we have more appliances at home, uh, in the office, in any in industries, but also because electric vehicles will emerge and that will require a lot more electricity uh, to be generated in order to be used. And the second big trend, which we'll focus on today, is the timing of this electricity consumption. We believe that it will be extremely important to have either the control or the influence of the timing of the demand in order to shift the timing of electricity and therefore avoid creating extra uh, power plants, um, which are quite costly, actually. And to control the timing of electricity consumption, there are three big loads which we believe are quite critical to control. One of which I mentioned is electric vehicle. So that's a, a relatively small market today. We are researching this uh, in depth actually at the moment. So this will be big. We know, we know this is going to be big, but today relatively small. There is a, a big trend of photovoltaics and batteries, which is one of the loads you can actually uh, control or influence the timing of, of use. And finally, the everything related to heating and cooling. So everything from electricity panel heaters, heat pumps, hot water tanks, air conditioning, et cetera, et cetera. And we believe this third category is actually the most uh, widespread across Europe and the world. And therefore, they will be the, the shortest opportunity to, to disrupt that market because connectivity will uh, will be embedded in these products over time. And therefore, there is a lot that can be done. There are other loads that can be debated, whether we can manage the uh, uh, influence the timing of consumption, like washing machines, dishwashers, lighting, etc. But at the end, these loads are not necessarily really big. And also, it's not really convenient for the customers to, um, to change the time at which they use their, their loads. So we do believe that these three uh, are, the, are the most important ones to consider. Now, talking about the electric heating and cooling markets, uh, we want to put this into a context compared to the, the gas boiler market in Europe. So there are around 85 million gas boilers in, uh, in Western Europe. And today, 5% of these are connected via smart thermostats or via direct uh, connectivity modules within the boiler. So it's quite a small market, but growing relatively fast, as you might have noticed in our Connectome research. Um, compared to actually the rest of the technologies we covered in the study. So from left to right, the electric heating panels. So really something that's plugging into a socket. And a home will have a few of these. That's actually what I have in my home. We estimate that in Western Europe, around 25 million homes have this sort of systems. And again, this can be debated about the numbers, but uh, with most of Western Europe covered in this number. And less than a percent of these homes have connected electric heating, and it's probably even less than that, actually. Same story with air conditioning, which can be found a lot more in South Europe. Uh, probably more in Italy, France, Spain, around 20 million homes have this sort of split unit, 
which today are mostly controlled with a, a remote control that uh, uh, tells the, the unit to be on or off and maybe uh, set up the temperature. And finally, a big, big market in Europe. There are around 50 million homes equipped with electric hot water tanks and almost none of them are connected today, uh, which is quite, a, we think, a big opportunity because uh, the hot water storage doesn't need to be consumed or generated at uh, any given time. Uh, this is quite a flexible load, actually. So we do believe that there is a massive opportunity for electric heating and cooling, both for space heating and, and water heating. So I will hand over to Pip to explain to us a little bit more about flexibility, how it works, and what we really need to understand in order to make the best analysis of this market. Thanks, Arthur. So I'm just going to briefly introduce demand side response and give um, our definition of, of how we would describe that. So demand side response is all about turning up or down or even shifting from one time period to another behind the meter energy demand. Now, this can be from any sector. Um, today, we're focusing on the residential sector, but it could also be from commercial and industrial sectors. And it can be from a range of assets. So Arthur's mentioned a few, storage, EVs, HVAC, lighting, and also on the commercial and industrial side, generators, whether CHP, diesel generators, EPSs, etc. So these loads are typically brought together or aggregated. And then the flexibility, so I mentioned you can turn these up, down, or shift from one period to another. So this flexibility is used to ensure the balance of supply and demand across the electricity system. And here I've just done a little picture of the transmission system or the, the local distribution system um, and the generation side as well. Now, this isn't a voluntary system. I don't think anyone would um, be involved unless there were price signals. So there are many different price signals that encourage um, aggregators and other industry stakeholders today to aggregate flexibility and monetize this. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but just to give you a few examples on the left hand side there. Today, typically, most um, industry stakeholders are monetizing flexibility through the transmission system ancillary services or balancing services, and fewer um, are actually monetizing this flexibility today through the electricity wholesale markets. Um, and previous to demand side response, so this is still a growing emerging market. Um, traditionally, the main method used to balance supply and demand has been to adjust the supply of the upstream. So very large power plants, generation assets were traditionally used to help um, balance the system. And Arthur's already mentioned the markets are changing. We are seeing more behind the meter assets, distributed assets, so EVs, electrical, um, HVAC, etc. Um, and on the upstream side as well, there's more distributed intermittent renewable generation sources. So lots of these changes are calling this need for flexibility on the demand side. A little look at European markets. Um, so there are markets today are opening for demand side response. That means value streams are becoming available um, across the, a range of different price signals that I mentioned for industry stakeholders to monetize flexibility today. So the map here, um, the countries in yellow, are where markets are open and commercially active, and the markets in blue are currently being developed. Um, not only are markets open, we are seeing activity as well. So there are many aggregators um, here's just a selection um, of a few examples of who are active today in residential DSR. Uh, now, this could be through trials, um, it could be more commercial, um, but there's lots of different approaches, business models um, happening today to monetize residential DSR. Now, I focused on aggregators, of course, there are other players as well trying to get in this space that the guys here will talk about a bit later. Um, but the main takeaway, which will lead nicely into the next point, is residential customers, you know, it's quite difficult to, to actually access them, as I'm sure you'll be fully aware, um, and can be quite costly, especially for DSR, where you may need some sort of control on site. 
And uh, the final comment on what Pip just talked about, the list of aggregators uh, on this slide, actually Pip has been working in the last few months in terms of profiling what these companies are doing. So if you're interested in understanding a bit more about the business models uh, of these companies and all the other aggregators in the market, uh, contact Pip and she will be able to tell you a lot more uh, about this. So during our research, we have tried to identify what are the main approaches for connecting electrothermal loads. And we will go through this in the next slide. So there are four main approaches in the market at the moment for connecting electric thermal loads. The first one being a demand side response or else DSR focused proposition. We see more, most activity in this case coming from aggregators who want to connect electric thermal loads to offer flexibility and participate in the flexibility markets. The main customer proposition in this case is usually around energy savings and some basic on and off controls. The second one is a control focus proposition. And in this case, we see most activity coming either from HVAC manufacturers or manufacturers of climate controls. In this case, the customer is offered connected controls, either as a retrofit solution like a th smart thermostat or as a built-in connectivity into the actual electric heating or cooling system. The third approach is a combination of the first two. So a DSR and a control focused proposition. In this case, the customer does get connected controls, but at the same time, the company is trying to, to connect the electric thermal loads and offer flexibility. This is quite a niche market today, but we see it emerging. The third one is a much more holistic approach. It's the home energy management proposition. And in this case, the customer is offered a holistic solution where it can optimize the electricity generated from PV panels or stored in batteries and use that for its electric heating or cooling or hot, hot water. This is quite a small market today, but we expect it to grow in the future. In the next slides, we will go through examples of the first three, but we will not cover the last one. And then um, to, to as an example from, from the demand side, response side, side of things, the number one leading player in the market in Europe in terms of the residential side of things is, is definitely Voltalis, which is especially active in, in the French market. So Voltalis' proposition was that they offered customers uh, a free gateway and, and a modulator that would be installed on an electric panel. The customer would get this for free and get some insights around the energy consumption. And in return, and for Voltalis, they would be then able to control certain electric appliances within the home. So the modulator would be installed on the electric panel of the customer's home. So it would only do really simple, crude on-off control. So turn off a whole circuit, for instance, which might have, let's say, a hot water tank or your electric space heating. And actually, uh, just to give you a practical example, I've recently been uh, a member of the trial that we are doing with Voltalis in the UK. So my home is actually equipped with electric panels and a hot water tank. Uh, driven by electricity and in my home there is basically four electric circuits uh, one looking at the, the electric heaters in the bedrooms one at the other electric heaters one at the main part of the water tank and one at the boost part of it so what Voltalis did is to set up this sort of uh, circuit breaker uh, with four switches so that each part could be turned on and off remotely at the times where they needed flexibility now when one thing we learned as part of the trial is that in the in the last few years some electricians have done work in my in my flat and they have actually used some of these electricity circuits to add lighting or a, a programmer or something like that and what we found out is that once uh, Voltalis decided to turn on and off um, potentially the heating it actually turned on and off uh, the lights and, and some other devices that were connected uh, and therefore these can be some of the limitations uh, of, of this sort of system. So you can obviously uh, see that some of the, uh, the household members were not particularly happy to have no light at, at night. But, uh, but we do think that's quite an interesting uh, solution anyway for, for residential customers. Then when we move on to the replacement market side of things, so new, new appliances, another example from the DSR focus, it would be Yaspi, which is a brand of Nibe in Finland. And those who don't know Nibe, it's a 
very large HVAC manufacturer, especially active in, in the Nordic, Nordic, Nordic markets. And what they have done is they have worked with a company called Their Corporation and actually built in integrated the connectivity into a regular hot water tank. So it's a very, you can buy the same model uh, with or without the connectivity. So it's just a standard hot water tank. But what their corporation is able to do is that they can interrupt the, the timing of the hot water tank. And their corporation has a lot of experience working with residential customers. So they completed trials, for instance, with the Finnish grid operator FinGrid and have been able to verify um, that their solution works and gives a quick enough response time. And now with the hot water tanks, they would be able to then participate in all the flexibility markets in Finland. And, and this is an example where uh, an HVAC manufacturer is coming together with, with a company that is specialized in, in, in aggregation. There is a, a quick question coming uh, on Voltalis. Uh, probably a question for Pip. Uh, for Voltalis, uh, do you know where the pricing uh, signal comes from? Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned just a minute ago, most of the aggregators monetize flexibility via the transmission system operator ancillary services um, and some through the wholesale market as well. Now in France, there's um, what's called the NIBIF market, which is accessing the wholesale electricity costs for all players. Um, and that's mainly where Voltalis is monetizing flexibility today. Thank you, Pip. And please continue sending your questions. We, we see a lot of questions that can be kept for the end. But the questions that uh, fit within the, the current slides, we will try to answer them as we go. So here we're going to talk through some examples of control focus propositions for electric heating. So a solution that is targeting the retrofit market has been developed by Group Muller in partnership with Natatmo. For those of you that didn't know, Group Muller is one of the leading players in the electric heating market in France. And their solution that they have developed with Natatmo is called Intuitive. This is a very simple connectivity module that can be very easily retrofitted in, the, in your existing electric radiator. It is a solution that is targeting the French market and will be compatible with all the Group Muller electric radiators. And some of the example companies doing uh, smart controls for electric heating are Delta Door and Atlantic, so some of the, the largest uh, heating rated companies in France. And their, their approach is actually quite interesting. So Delta Door manufactures um, thermostats or programmers for electric heating. And sometimes in the for the most recent products that they have installed, there is already a, a, a radio connectivity embedded in the product. So for customers to gain access to the, uh, the app and the whole connectivity, you just need to buy a gateway actually. And once you buy the gateway, you can automatically uh, find uh, the thermostats and then you can control uh, it with your app. So they have almost future-proofed their installations for, uh, for the upcoming market. And it's a similar um, approach with Atlantic, who has some of their most recent electric panels pre-connected in a way. And again, you just need to buy a, a gateway to connect them. If they are not connected, then you buy a small connectivity module that you attach to the electric panel. And again, with the gateway, you are able to do uh, connected controls. And now a solution that is targeting the replacement market. This is coming from the company Rointe. Rointa has recently launched a new product line for electric radiators, radiators and hot water tanks. And these systems have built-in connectivity, so they don't require a gateway. They are Wi-Fi connected as they are. This is an interesting solution, and Arthur has, again, a personal experience with them. Not particularly with them, yes, but uh, I was looking into how I could connect my electric heaters in, uh, in the UK, as there is no solution. And uh, I looked into Rointer and other companies, but basically the point is that this is very, very expensive uh, for the whole the whole replacement. It will cost two to three times much more to have connected heaters than having non-connected heaters. And that's, again, excluding the installation. So you can easily look at 5K plus uh, for the whole system, which I don't think most customers would go for. And apart from very wealthy customers, but that's not really a mass market. So there is a big need to bring the cost down if we want this market to uh, to go at scale. 
We also have a question from, from the audience around the limit on the market for flexibility and DSR and after which point does it become uneconomic? Um, you know, where is this limit expected? I think from that side of things, um, the in a way, the demand for flexibility will always be given at a given time. But as Pip mentioned, the increase in amount of intermittent generation, uh, let more and more old generation going offline, kind of this demand is likely to go up. But of course, it's a question of who can supply the flexibility. And that's kind of alluding to the title of our slide about race for, for scale in this area. Yeah, I also do think it's about how we see the trend of the market in that developing. I'm happy to talk to um, Anthony afterwards as well. Um, we have a, a view of the future and what that will look like. Certainly the market for flexibility and DSR won't always look the same as it is today. And it will chop and change um, as we see more smart meters, for example, going in, more time of use tariffs will open up. So maybe um, the, the very kind of reactive value streams that we have today will fold in um, and be merged with time of use signals, for example. Um, so there's, yeah, I have a, more ideas on the future and what that will look like. So happy to discuss that with Anthony afterwards too. Great to see that the topic of demand side response is one of the most exciting ones on this webinar. The next product category we focused on in this study is the electric hot water tanks. And again, splitting this by the retrofit versus the replacement market. So I recently trialed a beta version of the M Climate uh, product. M Climate is a Bulgarian startup focusing on uh, creating new products for, for the connected home. And basically to try to understand how some customers like me control their hot water tank, there is basically no control over the tank uh, in my flat. The only thing you can do is turn on and off the tank. And if the tank overheats or basically is full, this there is basically a sort of fuse that will shut down uh, the tank and you need to manually uh, click on that fuse so that you can reset it later on. So this is an absolutely terrible customer experience, which can be upgraded with uh, simple smart controls like this one really. So, we do believe that there is a huge opportunity and more importantly, for flexibility purposes, you don't need your tank to be uh, heated uh, between 12 and three. You can do that at any time of the day, as long as you have enough hot water when you need it. And therefore that's one of the most influenceable uh, electric loads that we can find in the market. And there's some trials today as well. So preheating that hot water tank, um, if you know, if you can learn how the customer is gonna use their heating in their home, you can preheat so they have enough hot water. That's, you know, that's a form of demand side response. They can use the heat later on, they can get rewarded um, or whatever the business model is being used. You can shift that load very easily. And there are also examples of uh, the replacement market where hot water tanks come already connected. So we mentioned uh, Nibi and uh, Reuter, they are also doing this sort of products uh, for the replacement, which we, we won't go to in, in details. Then on the on the cooling side of things, there's already a lot of companies, mostly kind of startup companies um, from smart home specialists that are looking to connect retrofit existing air conditioning AC units. And how this is done today is typically using infrared communication. So there's going to be a, a transmitter that sends an infrared signal to the air conditioning unit. So effectively just mimicking the old analog controller that customer used to use to control their air conditioning. And of course, this is some of the things we mentioned around limitations of, of some of these retrofit technologies. For instance, in this case, typically the smart control of the AC unit will have no way of knowing if the signal actually reached the AC unit. So a lot of these devices, for instance, will be sending the signal loads of times within, let's say, a period of five minutes, just continuously sending the signal just to make sure that the message has gone through to the AC. So a lot of these solutions are yet not very uh, ideal in the installation and the installation at times requires a bit of customer effort of let's say programming the control. Then on the replacement market side of things, um, there's the logos of, of many of the large AC manufacturers there. They're in gray as a lot of these companies, they have the capability of, of building in these solutions or easily modifying their production line to add the connectivity module into the AC units, but many of them have chosen not to do this. Um, it also comes down to the question around when we talk about flexibility is 
is who pays for the connectivity in, in the unit. So for someone like big manufacturer like Mitsubishi, it's an added cost to put that into your unit. And, and what's, the, what's the return you get on it? And of course, the aggregators might not be willing to pay for this, this added connectivity. They would, of course, love to have it, but, but who pays for it? And then this takes on us to the kind of the future, which will be a combination of, of the comfort side of things and, and then the demand side response coming together. And there's some examples of companies kind of having this vision from the start when they begin the development of the product. So for example, Dimplex, they have developed a storage heater called Quantum Heater, which they are actively already trialing of using it, not just for comfort controls, but also participating in, in demand response initiatives. But the reality of it is that this is still on kind of trial basis and, and the flexibility markets, it's, it's not easy. They're not always that simple to work in. So still actually in the market, it's being sold to customers more on, on, the, on the comfort side of things rather than actually the demand side response. And that takes us to the question, you know, moving between DSR and, and, and the control focus, it's not necessarily that simple. If you look from a company who's a flexibility specialist wanting to move to provide controls for, for climate comfort, there's, let's say in the case of Altalis, there's likely a need for additional hardware or software with, with a lot of competition from existing players offering already smart thermostats. So the control often from the aggregator side might be quite simple on off. So from the customer point of view, it's, it's, that's not really sufficient, so there might be an added, added hardware that's needed. And also the cost of this can be quite prohibitive. So if a customer has been given a flexibility solution, DSR solution, and they were promised cost savings, now all of a sudden they have to pay money for comfort and that cost is likely to very much outweigh the revenue gain from the flexibility side of things. So it's a very different customer proposition uh, when it comes down to that. And also if you, if you want to bring connected thermostats for uh, to the customers and if you are not a, a tech company in a or a customer tech company it's very hard to compete with the customer experience that others will be able to do so we mentioned for example Netatmo uh, there will be others in this market they have years of experience of improving uh, the customer interface the experience etc so it's not an easy business to replicate and I think you really hit the nail on the head there Arthur and it's exactly the same the other way around so the DSR stakeholders, the aggregators, they are really the experts in the customer journey for DSR. Um, so you really are comparing two quite different markets at the moment. And they, the specialism is quite separate for both of the sides of the coin, if you like. And, and I can imagine this is where we'll see a lot of partnerships with, for instance, HVAC manufacturers not looking to do uh, all the complications around the aggregation and all of that themselves, but might be you know, partnering with 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 some specialist companies on that. And we've already seen, seen some examples already in this webinar today on that. And just as an example on the commercial and industrial side, which is where the market for demand side response is a bit more developed, we have a few examples of aggregators working directly with manufacturers. Um, so loose partnerships, trials, um, and partnerships to build in um, the communication software they need in their aggregation platform to respond to certain controllers or systems that the product manufacturer is producing. So it's about moving that now from the, the commercial and industrial space into the residential space. Such an exciting market to follow, actually. And that's why we think this, uh, this study actually highlights some of the, the most important trends that you will see around um, thermal electric loads. And it's, it won't be an easy market to crack. There will be lots to, to learn and to, to discuss with players. And we're very happy to, to facilitate and help you understand this better. So moving on to the key takeaways and what we think, what we think are the key messages out of this sort of analysis. Well, first of all, competition wise, and this is a list of some of the players active in different space from control companies, HVAC, aggregators and energy suppliers across different product categories. The mo when we published this a few weeks ago and continue to interview companies, we see that they're actually companies launching products all the time. Everyone is interested in this. Everyone starts to understand the value of having either customer focused controls or a DSR proposition. And some of them are also trying to future proof their products so that they will be um, they will be able to play in both markets. 
Whether this will happen in the next year or two, it's very hard to say. But uh, we do believe that this will be a very dynamic market, and that will be quite uh, exciting to follow. A quick example on this list, as we didn't talk about energy suppliers yet, at the bottom right of the slide, you will see SOE, which is the uh, spin-off energy supplier of EDF in France. SOE is already offering electric controls uh, or connected controls for electric heaters in France, and they're actually bundling this with energy supply contracts. So they really believe that as part of a connected home energy supplier and service company that you need to offer this kind of products. So perhaps this can this can help check the market. We know so we have a as big marketing budget, so the customer awareness is likely to to rise as well in, in the coming months and years. They also have access to EDF's own um, aggregator subsidiary, um, Agrigio, in France as well, which is quite interesting. I wonder if they will start to bring all those pieces together in such a very large company, whether that will be possible and whether they'll be nimble enough to do that and to be a challenger in the French market for maybe Voltalis. Again, something very interesting to watch. Then Arthur already alluded to that this will not be easy. Um, so we also identified some some barriers on on companies making this journey. One kind of obvious barrier for for electric heating is that market is very fragmented. So from going from country to country, there is a wide range of different types of systems and also a wide range of different types of brands. So there's a lot of variety between countries, but often also within a country. So often requires a lot of special expertise around understanding that really the structure of the heating market to be able to offer these solutions to customers. And that's true for <clears throat> any sort of technology from air conditioning. We mentioned that every brand can work a bit differently, but also electric heaters, some of which are direct panel heaters, some of which are storage heaters. Uh, every manufacturer might have a, a closed uh, protocol so to not allow any third party to to bring connectivity into it. So yeah, so there is a big fragmentation on every every part of these these technologies. And then also there's some you know technical challenges to overcome. So for instance, we talked about the uh, residential DSR flexibility markets in in being able to get a quick enough response time, verifying that signal and complying with local regulation, which also can vary from one market to another, and and then. The question around retrofit installation. So if you do a retrofit solution, um, the experience of a lot of the companies doing this is that it's really hard to predict the cost of an installation. Often um, there's a lot of bespoke work, tailored work that needs to be done in every home, which really drives up the up the cost, which is really one of the other challenges. Is it's especially significant for the retrofit side of things. Um, for let's say electric panel heaters, if you need to connect every single panel heater individually that really adds up the cost over over a house and that, that's why we're seeing companies like uh, Delta Door Atlantic trying to basically future proof their solutions to be able to able to do this in a, in a more cost effective manner and then when we talk about flexibility there's really uncertainty over the value what's the future value of demand side response and this will be different in different markets but also it might be very different within a country very local um, so that that's really is a, is a big barrier to overcome, and and I can ask over to Pip from for some more commentary on that. I would just um, we had a question from someone on um, Dominic. Thank you on the, whether the DSR market um, at the DNO, the local level, um, will start to become an opportunity. And I think that brings in nicely to this fourth point here on uncertainty. The markets um, for DSR across Europe are constantly changing, evolving. Regulations are changing, and yes, absolutely, the local energy. Um, markets are becoming an opportunity. We're seeing many DSOs um, leading innovation trials and creating projects with many different partnerships and collaborations across the board. So that's absolutely a value stream that will open and evolve um, as the markets also change. And there's also on the question, there was um, an example around electric vehicles. And we've actually just now publishing a really big study looking at smart EV charging, which is really looking to tackle this issue around around often the local issues. And there are already some applications, for instance, that are helping customers manage um, their peak consumption, which they can also get a, a significant financial benefit as well. So there are applications out there already on this. Um, but not to not to end on a, on, a, on a down note, there's also very several reasons to be really optimistic about this market. Um, 
the electrification and digitization is really happening across the board. It's really kind of referring to what, what Arthur said at the very start of the webinar with, with all the all the technologies, new technologies coming into the homes. So really this big picture, I don't think you can, you can ignore that. And then when it comes to the smart home market, we've already, we saw that that gas heating side of things, we already penetration of around 5% and that market is continuously growing. And we're really seeing much more mature solutions in terms of the actual technical implementation, but also really the customer experience from the early days of the smart home uh, has really evolved. And I think a lot of those learnings can be moved on to the electrical side of things. And, and one of the big things that's happened in the smart home market is really the, the smart speakers, the voice control. And I think in here is where this would be really much better suited for, let's say, electric heating rather than, than gas-based heating. So for, for direct electric heating, the, there's very low inertia in the system, so the reaction times are very quick. So the customer can really, if they turn on an electric panel heater uh, with their voice, Within minutes, they'll notice a difference in that. And the same goes for cooling as well. So it's a really different customer experience. And I think actually this application is much more, much better suited on, on the direct electric side of things rather than, than the gas, gas and hydronic systems. And also, I think there's a really big competitive component to this for, for the HVAC manufacturers. Um, staying on top of connectivity with, I think, on the gas heating side, smart thermostats increasingly becoming the norm for new installation and this kind of similar custom experience of expectation how you interact with your heating system it will move over to the electric side of things as well and of course there's loads of additional services service components you can also uh, bundle in with this connectivity as well so there's opportunities there definitely so before we, we conclude on that webinar, please continue to fire your questions. We are we are recording uh, all of them. Uh, the last five, 10 minutes will be used just for answering questions. So please, anything that's on your mind, uh, just write it in the in the question box. But just to give you a brief summary of the, the study, to, to give you a bit of the, the sales pitch of this, if you're not a subscriber, uh, it covers basically markets uh, analysis and forecasts uh, per country, benchmarking the countries on different criteria. We looked at case studies and really deep analysis of some of the, the types uh, of propositions that are available in this market. We, we even looked at uh, Australia, actually, because it's quite an interesting uh, PV and battery market, but also air conditioning. So there might be some opportunities which vary from state to state. We know some of the aggregators like, like Tico are actively looking at this market, and there is a big reason why. And we also benchmark the, the products uh, from functionalities, uh, the protocols, what you can do with the voice, and uh, where the countries they are based in, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, <clears throat> so this, this study really helps you understand the opportunity, what's going on, who is doing what, and how your business is best place uh, to fit uh, within that. Got a quick question now on uh, whether we see Apple, Amazon, and Google becoming significant players in home control as they have huge penetration of connected home devices. But in a way, they don't necessarily have electric thermal load control or connected control. So their goal is to really increase their share of the, the voice control, uh, the smart speaker, and also any sort of devices integrated with this. So they will be a promoter of that market rather than a competitor. Uh, we Amazon, for example, is forcing companies to have compatible Alexa, Alexa skills with them in order to be promoted on the Amazon marketplace. Uh, and I don't think Amazon wants to. Um, I, I think Amazon wants to remain neutral in terms of technology as long as they make their money uh, by selling the devices. Uh, and then we have another question around um, on the feeding tariff cycle of solar PV and, and how that will change and will that have an impact on, on connected controls. And I think we're we'll going to see that's something we covered in the report. I didn't have the chance to get into today. Was also, but in, in, for instance, in Germany, the, this opportunity is really coming up in, in the next few years as the feeding tariffs are being phased away from some old installations. And we're already seeing a lot of activity in this market and, and that will be a big opportunity. And with regards to the opportunity for demand-side response, I think Bart had a question on that as well. Um, absolutely, with decreasing feeding tariffs, that leads 
towards an opportunity of self-consumption um, to optimize your self-consumption of your PV system. Obviously, that then leads to an opportunity for some sort of storage, whether battery storage or um, you know, hot water tanks, thermal storage and diverting that. So absolutely, it depends on your definition of demand side response. You know, Self-consumption is um, a value stream there for that. So decreasing feed tariffs will only open up the opportunity, especially as um, electricity prices also do um, increase. And some markets we see a much higher electricity price than others, for example, Germany compared to, for example, the UK. Um, so yes, absolutely, that is a, a driver there. Thanks, Pip. There is a, maybe a final question we can take. Uh, talking about aggregators again, uh, would aggregators not concentrate on commercial and industrial customers rather than residential customers with high transaction costs for small loads? So basically, why the hell would aggregators look at residential mm -hmm. if they can uh, make some money in commercial <laughs> industrial? It's a very good question. And I think that pretty much describes the narrative of the market today. So the demand side response market today is very much large um, industrial loads and backup generators. So quite a lot of diesel generators, some CHP um, and other generators, battery storage in some markets where the battery market exists. That's a relatively new load there. Um, and industrial processes, so you know, big metal crushers and aluminium smelters and chemical processing. So absolutely, that is where the aggregators, most of the aggregators are focusing. Um, some are trying to distinguish themselves by focusing on the residential side. And obviously, to, to focus on the residential side, it makes sense to um, plan in for residential DSR in products. So you see lots of, um, I think some of the ones that Matty talked about earlier there and Jaspi um, partnering. So it doesn't make sense to go around knocking on doors as an aggregator and connecting residential customers. What it does make sense to do is partner with a product manufacturer and install whatever communication software you need in that product to be able to just activate it online. Um, so you don't want to go into that property because yes, the transaction cost is far too high. Um, the other aspect of that is you need a portfolio big enough um, to be able to monetize. So for residential loads, obviously you need much, much more um, loads aggregated to be able to create that one megawatt, uh, which is sometimes a minimum threshold for some of the value streams to be able to monetize that. And as a, as a quick comment there, I think this comes really why we think the future is of the combination of, of these two approaches and with, with a lot of these connectivity integrated, but also on some of the new technologies like electric vehicles, some of the issues might be very local. So you actually for the local uh, distribution network, the low voltage network to work properly, there might be uh, demand for actually really at a household level managing the loads, for instance, for not, not going, con, um, causing power outages in a, in a local level. Thanks, Matty. Thanks, Pip, for this uh, heated discussion. Uh, <laughs> Just to summarize a bit what, uh, what we offer at Delta specifically on this topic. So we have uh, three, four different subscription services uh, in addition to the, the Connect Dome one, um, the flexibility and energy storage, the EV and electricity, the customer data value advisory service. And basically all this landscape of expertise help join the dots as we did today in this, in this webinar. And we do think it's extremely important uh, to join the dots to make the right decisions in the new energy markets, uh, particularly for, for the connected home and electric heating and cooling. It's particularly important to understand what's going on, flexibility, perhaps in EV, perhaps in storage as well. Uh, so we do think uh, having our expertise uh, will help you understand uh, how to make the best out of, the, out of this market. And we have more questions, but we are running out of time. I uh, apologize for that, but uh, we will follow up with you after the webinar, uh, if that's okay with you, to answer your questions. Um, this webinar was recorded, uh, so you can watch it again on YouTube after it. Uh, we can send you the slides if you want. You can share it with your colleagues and talk about it as much as you'd like. Um, in terms of uh, next step of our service, we will continue uh, looking at this topic and update uh, the landscape of this space as we go, because it's really, really exciting space. Um, if you have additional questions, please reach out to us. Uh, you have our contact details. Uh, we are always happy to have a, a really good conversation. And I think this is all for now. So let me uh, thank uh, Evita, Pip and Mati for their contribution. And I hope to, uh, to see you again, guys, uh, on another webinar. 
Thank you very much and goodbye.